Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the important work of natural history museums and science museums with special guests, Claudio Gomez, Executive Director of the McClung uh, Museum of Natural History and Culture at the University of Tennessee, Amy Harris, Director of the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History, and Halsey Spruance, Executive Director of the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so grateful and I'm so excited about uh, this topic. Natural history museums enjoy overwhelming popularity in this uh, country and worldwide. Science museums are so, so exciting. And in the US alone, there are hundreds of such museums and, and attendance is great. I mean, people would love to have this type of attendance at their institutions. And it's people of all ages. Now, keeping specimen collections is important. It's expensive. And then we have uh, the curators, the staffs, the buildings. We're talking about a, a very sophisticated operation and natural history and science museums are so intrinsic to education in this country. And it also informs things like our policy, right? That education informs what we actually decide and do. And, and so, Claudia, let's start with you. Why should Tennesseans care about your work? Why is your institution so important within your state, within your region, and with our, within our country? Well, that's a good question, and, and thank you for having me here today. Um, the first reason I would say is that the Tennessee River itself is a hotspot of biodiversity, uh, not just in the in the U.S., but in the world. So for us at the McLean, uh, getting to have the opportunity to explain or present that biodiversity to our visitors and communities around us, I think it's, it's very important. So that's one of the uh, key projects that we're working on. Uh, in the not too distant future. So uh, Tennesseans should worry about whatever is happening around them because whatever happens in Tennessee probably <laughs> is also happening in other places of the world. And natural history museums are trying to uh, present those issues and those challenges all around the world. So, so part of your point is that we're trying to create a sustainable world, a world that we can all enjoy and our children can enjoy, our grandchildren can enjoy for years. And your research, your research is not only unfolding the history and the, and the science embedded in the environs of Tennessee, but it also allows us to make really, really smart decisions going into the future. Amy, talk a little bit about your work at the University of Michigan. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Um, the Univers University of Michigan has one of the largest natural history collections in the world with about 20 million specimens. But we have a, an unusual structure where we're, we have research museums that are not open to pub the public, but the museum I direct is open to the public. So we're the portal by which the public can access some of the research and things that go on in the collections. One of the ways we do that is by offering a science communication training program. So at our museum, the public has an opportunity to talk directly with scientists about their research to see the collections and to learn about the importance of them. So it's a little bit different structure than, um, than some other museums, but our focus is on communicating research and giving the public access to the research. So that's really interesting. So you, you become the intermediary that, that uh, makes the, and ex excuse me for saying this, the sciencey stuff accessible to somebody like me. Absolutely. We personalize science by giving people an opportunity to meet scientists, to ask them questions, to look at things from their work, to touch things, to um, ask the questions that they have. And what is the mix of, of ages that are exposed to that knowledge within your institution? Do you have a audience that skews younger or uh, older? What, what is that? Well, I've had this discussion with consultants before who wanted me to choose one audience to focus on, and I've resisted that at every step. We really do serve everyone. College students are important because we're a university, but we have families with small children who come to, the, to our scientist spotlight events, as well as adults who kind of wish the kids would stop asking questions so they can talk to the son. <laughs> and Halsey, you're, you're also, you represent a, a university museum. You just had a name change to the, uh, 
to the Delaware Museum of, of Nature and Science. Talk a little bit about that and also about your the, the logic behind your $11 million uh, expansion as well. Well, uh, uh, un unlike, thank you for having me on, Mark. Much appreciated. Great to be here. Uh, unlike Claudio and, and Amy, uh, the Museum of Nat Nature and Science here in Delaware is not affiliated with the university. So we're somewhat different. And uh, we are just uh, finishing up uh, an $11 million capital campaign to uh, reinvent ourselves, put ourselves in the 21st century with uh, new, new practices on how visitors are interacting, which is great. Um, I'd like to get to this, uh, the collections part. The, uh, we, we, the collections obviously are a, a, a record of biodiversity throughout the history and time and across the globe. Uh, an important part of our focus here at the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science is that uh, those collections and the work that's being done there, uh, we're not encyclopedic in our collections. We don't go for everything. We're, we're, we really specialize in, in mollusks and birds. That's really where we go for. But that information informs what goes on to our general public. So uh, yes, we, we are uh, specializing in, in mollusks and, and birds, but those curators, those in, um, collections managers are the ones that help us validate uh, what our messages are going on downstairs. So it's not just a bunch of, uh, you know, Bachelor of Arts uh, graduates with uh, education degrees. We actually have some hard science that informs what we're doing downstairs. That's an important part. You know, we did the search for the Nature Conservancy's uh, uh, executive director at Pennsylvania and Delaware. And mm -hmm. the, the science-based conservation work really does take uh, knowledge that has been developed over the millennia and uses that to inform their current research. So the the idea of having a, 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 um, a catalog of knowledge accessible through the university is is so important. And Claudio, you were you were saying something before the show started about your collection that also connects to uh, Halsey's strength in mollusks, in mollusks in particular. Could you talk a little bit about that and 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 how this is so important to have in different parts of the country these different collections that can be used by scientists as a reference? Yeah, well, as uh, Halsey was saying. Um, um, biological collections in museums are systematic, and they're in, in, in that sense, museums are true libraries of biodiversity. So it's just like libraries. You you would like to have as many as, as you can and, and distribute it uh, for access, for different types of research, of course, collecting what is closer to them. In that case, like my, in the picture in my background, uh, fresh water mussels from the Tennessee River and other uh, tributaries and rivers here in, in East Tennessee. So uh, understanding that, for example, the uh, big uh, hydraulic uh, works in the, from the 30s, you know, how that changed the environment, how that changed the development or sometimes the survival of certain species. That's how you can understand that over the years in these libraries. And um, taxonomers, uh, by either biologists or uh, other kind of uh, um, professionals, uh, will um, give you that information. And probably now we can probably make better decisions than in the 30s, hopefully. And in the sense of keeping our biodiversity, because we depend as a human species, we depend of a biodiversity uh, or biodiverse uh, environment. Uh, the, 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 the more specialized you get, the more uh, open you are to uh, dramatic changes. So I think museums can tell those stories. They actually tell the stories. And, um, and we should keep focusing on, on, on issues that are very, um, I would say, sometimes challenged. But uh, we have to rely also, on, and especially here in the U.S., how museums are trusted by the general public to tell these stories. Um, science needs to be out, and museums, I think, are the excellent vehicles to tell those stories. So important. You know, your, your point about the effect of, of dams and the Tennessee Valley Authority um, in order to create electrification uh, throughout that region, um, on the wildlife and the ecosystems. We were just talking with the Deschutes uh, Land Trust and, and there it's, it's about the electric dams and the, um, and the salmon, the salmon fisheries. Um, uh, Amy, how do you explain these types of downstream impacts on our food chain or on our environment, on, on, um, on our plant life? How do you explain that through your exhibitions so that people understand the connections between esoteric knowledge that might just be embedded in, in layers of clay 
and what is going on today when I establish a business, for example, mm -hmm. for uh, generating uh, electricity for cars, right, or storing electricity in batteries, which requires chemicals, which, which requires extractive minerals, right? How do we balance our interests and use this, this, this knowledge to create better decisions for us all? Well, a couple of um, responses come to mind. One is that we have a longstanding, but currently mothballed because of COVID, COVID uh, science cafe series. And these are the kind of topics that are really great um, as discussion points, where we would invite a combination of faculty and community members to present information on these really current issues, and then invite discussion with the audience with experts so they can get their questions answered. But we also um, reflect these kinds of current topics in our exhibits. We have some special exhibits that change frequently that are called research stations. And they are quick changing um, current research of our faculty that address a lot of questions such as the ones you just raised. You know, we, we could do a little bit of a better job, perhaps a much better job of making these in-person experiences engaging. We just finished a, a poll in which we asked, you know, where do people get their information? And a third of them said museums. We've done this poll over and over and over again over the years. And that one third uh, kind of thing constantly comes up. Is there a way that we can make, uh, in the way that Amy was describing, Halsey, is there a way that we can make our in-person experiences more interactive, more exciting? Can we reshape those experiences so that people just can't wait to get to the museum and are thinking about you every single day? <laughs> That's the goal every day. Uh, no, along the lines of what Amy's talking about, yeah, uh, we tend to benchmark in this industry in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of free flowing information that goes back and forth, especially when you have geography distances between Michigan and Tennessee. Uh, we too also are, are doing exactly what uh, Amy's talking about rather than research stations, we're calling it research headquarters, where we actually have not only the, the research that's going on within this museum, but the other things that are going on at Delaware State University, University of Delaware, Academy of Natural Sciences, where we're highlighting that information, highlighting that research, highlighting those programs uh, within our galleries. And there's a couple of, it's a little more higher brow than the normal, you know, uh, children experience coming through, which is good, which is a good thing. And what we're looking at is to, uh, one, show off the great information that, that's being, uh, that's being accumulated, uh, but also to incite some careers, uh, in underserved audiences and particularly in, in, in young women. Uh, which is an, uh, an underrepresented um, a, a, a workforce in the, in the in the scientific community. So that's where we're looking to kind of have almost an economic benefit for the rest of the world. I mean, it's we're not uh, I'm humble, but uh, it, it is a part of our nonprofit mission to get that going, to, to spread the word. That's really interesting. So, so you're drawing the connection between what you're doing and workforce development and, and people entering the STEM uh, professions. And frankly, if you look at STEM professions, I just did a show on this, 89% of, of people in STEM are men, yeah. which means that we're not using our, all of our resources, which just, you know, just from an American eco economic perspective is just unbelievably stupid. We need to, we need to repair that, don't we? Yeah. Well, with our so, we, we take it one step further, too, in addition, and uh, and that is um, we also take those research stories and we actually put them into interactive um, activities within the, uh, the museum, the new museum, uh, where we're tying that together. So, for instance, you may have a, uh, a researcher at the University of Delaware. He'll have a research story going on in the research headquarters, but also putting uh, an activity in the discovery gallery where he's talking about his um, uh, coastal erosion work that he's doing uh, along the Delaware Bay. How, how often do you think about fun? The whole idea of edutainment, right, which was a dirty word, but the but the actual, you know, which which in some museum environments is is viewed as kind of a pejorative, the fun word, right? Fun experiences. Uh, Amy, Claudia, you want to jump in on this? I don't think that you should 
uh, um, exclude the word fun of your <laughs> dictionary or when you're setting goals for yourself and your team. I mean, it's, uh, and, um, I think that you can, you can measure the success of your work by the laughter that you hear in the galleries. And I think that's, that's, I think that's a good benchmark. Uh, science is fun. And <laughs> in, 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 if you're not doing it in the funny way, I think you should be uh, worried. Um, that doesn't mean, and, and that's one of the things that sometimes you hear scientists saying, oh, we need to dumb down things. Right. And I'm always saying you need to smart up. Right. It's, it's the other way around. It's not that you are here and the other you know, visitors are you know, way, way down there. No, no, no. Uh, people... Visitors are usually smarter in their own ways, and they they will you know you know find out very quickly if you're not being you know you know precise or you're not being accurate or you're not using some of the resources that they're expecting to see uh, in your gallery. So I think fun should be part of the work. Yeah, you know, also I'll point out that um, you know I think increasingly we're seeing uh, uh, um, requirements in National Science Foundation grants that require not just uh, the, the research to be done for a project, but also in incorporating a, a public component to it. So a lot of the researchers that we have around here that like to be in their silos doing their research are having to actually come down and do something with it. Uh, and initially that was in the form of two you know, poster sessions and stuff. And that's changing. I think we're seeing a lot of researchers that really understand the value of uh, the um, public dissemination of the work that they're doing. I love I love the laughter metric. Right, Amy? I mean, isn't that I, you, you were just laughing or, or smiling along and nodding. Um, it's the laughter metric, isn't it? I, that, I love it. That, that noisiness in the galleries that you're that you're looking for. Yeah, I love it. I love that idea of a laughter metric. For for me, it had been, um, you know, hearing people say, "Wow," you know, oh, I didn't know that. I hear that every day when I walk through the galleries. But I was also chuckling because, um, you know, how can you not love working in a place where people come to see the dinosaurs yeah. and the the awestruck children who know more than the staff do about the dinosaurs? That's how I kind of think of that as how we bring people in. They come to see the dinosaurs, but once they're here, then they stumble on all the other amazing things that we have and the fun things that we have. But we've done put a lot of effort into making the experience at our museum fun. One of the things that I've noticed in the study of paleontology, so uh, dinosaurs, is the, the shift from when I was uh, really young. When I was really young, it was the fascination with the, the big boned animals. Um, but as we've seen uh, studies on what happened uh, as climate change and the demise of the dinosaurs, uh, we're going to studies of much smaller animals and seeing um, how uh, which animals survived and how and what the strategies were that allowed that survival to take place. Because we're seeing a very rapid uh, climate shift. We're seeing die offs of species at, at an amazing rate. And we're using that sort of past reference as a reference for what we're doing in the future. Could you talk a little bit about how you see uh, the uh, use of, of science that you expose to uh, inform the behaviors in, in your various communities and how that uh, connects to uh, things that are happening, for example, in public schools and, and policy debates in government, Halsey? Do you have any any um, uh, examples that you'd like to highlight in how the knowledge that you have in your institution are affecting others? Uh, well, yeah, I think um, uh, part of this this migration from you know twentieth century learning to twenty first uh, is certainly we still rely on that lecture type thing and and the kids you know knowing more of the dinosaur names than than uh, than most lay people now. Um, but where we're taking it one step further is uh, the interdisciplinary science where you can actually, for instance, look at. Uh, fossil records to 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 start to figure out you know were there feathers on this animal were there uh, were there uh, colors within those feathers and that becomes really interesting in terms of a dialogue and that's the, that's science based uh, when it comes down to the, the uh, uh, doing policy or affecting policy especially as it goes to climate change uh, we are actually you know raising 
discussing those topics within the museum, which wasn't there before. Uh, there wasn't a, a basically a place for that discussion. And uh, certainly we are science based and uh, uh, and but but having those discussions is an important part uh, where we see ourselves as a forum um, for having those discussions. So you're internally challenging the uh, traditional categorization of, of, of uh, different segments, paleontology or uh, maybe the physical sciences, mineral sciences, and so on and so forth. And you're looking at cross-cutting topics like global warming and right. taking di- um, elements from each of these disciplines to create uh, a separate category that allows for uh, exploration across disciplines, engaging different scientists and different collections. Without question. That is, you, you nailed it. And, and even they- science and art, sorry. So go, go ahead, go ahead, Claudia. You no, know, even science and art, because when you see those drawings of, uh, yeah. you know, extinct animals, it's, it's it's part science and it's also part imagination. And those that are bringing those animals to life and, uh, you know, by dimensional representation are artists, even though they may be trying in science, what you're seeing, you know, sometimes in the uh, first page of nature, whatever, are, these are drawings that are quite pieces of art and are people collecting a natural history illustration since, you know, centuries, since the first illustrators, you know, uh, took um, that important role in presenting uh, science findings. That's really interesting. You know, if you look at the uh, Audubon's drawings of birds, right, Some sometimes those drawings, because they highlight key features and not all the information that you'd have in a photo, it becomes easier to navigate the actual uh, features and distinguishing aspects of different species than, than uh, using a photograph. Amy, do you have a particular uh, favorite example of how your work actually connects to things that are being discussed right now and actions that are being taken uh, in Michigan? Yeah, um, we reorganized our fossil hall from, uh, it was previously organized around groups of animals, but now it's a walk through time. That's not an, an unusual organization, but we really have called out the sequence of mass extinctions over time. We have pillars that are tall and they're burned to show the extent of extinction of species at each of those marking markers, milestones along the way. And so by the time you get to today and you look at the sixth extinction pillar, you really have a sense that, wow, you know, 95% of species could go extinct. Life will rebound, but we might not be here. In this particular instance, we can have a different, make a difference because human actions are having an impact on the rate of extinction. Now we can change that and we can save ourselves. Well, that's that's a really interesting point, and and what you're saying is is that in terms of the mass side, we we have always affected environments on a micro level. I mean, look at the deforestation of Greece and Scotland, and and how that affected the environment. But that's on a, a more of a local and micro level. But this mass extinction that is globe wide, this is the first mass extinction that is being driven by us, and, and it's our behavior. So changing those behaviors could perhaps alter the trajectory, right? Right. Absolutely. It's a very powerful message. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, an interesting topic. Very often in these discussions, I'm dealing with um, with uh, three guests who are all white guys. Right. Um, In this in this case, we've got a, a, a group of people from different parts of the country, different ethnicities, genders um, and, and so on. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how representation affects or doesn't affect this. We've, we, we've so often thought that science is kind of neutral. And then we see a, a film like uh, Hidden Figures, um, where it becomes so very clear that without those women who uh, were groundbreaking breaking mathema- mathematicians, we would have ended up with uh, disasters in space. Um, Let's talk a little bit about how this this whole topic has affected you, affected what you actually display, affected your boards, affected your staff. Halsey, um, how is this issue of representation as it's unfolded over the last, in particular the last years, affected your operations at the uh, Delaware Museum of Nature and Science? As you may know, um, Wilmington, Delaware is a a corporate headquarters and a corporate uh, place. So there's a lot of lawyers and there's a lot of investment bankers and they tend to be all white. And they're great people to have on the board because um, they give well, which is nice. 
Um, but in this, uh, and, and that's fine, but in, in this world of generating partnerships, uh, what we've been uh, focused on is looking at a broader representation of the community and uh, beyond the banking uh, and law firms. And how we've gone about that is to get into the universities, get into these leadership programs that are here in uh, in, in Wilmington, Delaware. And, and what we're finding is that there's a whole bunch of stuff, that, a whole bunch of people out there that have a lot to bring to this museum. And oh, by the way, they also have a broader uh, representation of uh, the community in terms of their skin color and their their gender and stuff like that. It's it's been remarkable. So for, I, I'll use an example. Um, you know, we were we're working with the University of Delaware on some stuff, and uh, we had the dean of the college and the Earth, Ocean, and Environment there, and she happened to be not only a PhD but a woman, and she's not just African American; she's actually African. So uh, that was a great kind of a, a way to bring in a bunch of things for our um, diversification uh, and to represent the community. That's the real part is represent the community. That's really interesting. And you're bringing in the international perspective as well. Also very important. Somebody yeah. who has not grown up in this country and might see the entire uh, natural history sphere and the science sphere uh, in a distinctive way. You're also bringing up another point, which is that uh, just like science, there's there's often this view that wealth is neutral, but it isn't. If wealth already skews to particular ethnic groups, then wealth is not neutral. So if you build boards based on the ability to give, then you're you're automatically skewing boards. So you're yeah. you're basically taking a new view from top to bottom, aren't you, Halsey? In terms of governance, in terms of board composition, in terms of your staff composition, without throwing out what has been done before you're rethinking what you're going to be doing in the future. Oh, without question. Yeah. And then the, beyond this, the board part. Uh, so, you know, traditional ways of, uh, of hiring or get recruiting employees, you know, we used to go to the, the traditional outlets to the, you know, the, the newspaper and whatnot. And now we're reaching out to these, um, there's several HBCUs in this area, historically black um, colleges and universities, one of which is Dell State. The other one is Lincoln Universities. And there's a couple more. So we're actually, you know, uh, and, and the idea of that you were saying something about the uh, the women are not represented in science. And so we're missing out on those people. Um, so the same idea, if we get into those HBCUs, we can actually tap into or mine um, uh, an audience for bringing into the museum culture, the museum profession that will have a you know, broader impact. Big time. How, do you, how do you see uh, see this? We're coming to the end of our time. So we're going to give you um, a last word and Amy a last word. How do you see this really important topic? Well, uh, uh, it wasn't that long ago we had a town hall meeting with uh, the chancellor of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, uh, Dr. Don Diplomat, and she was challenging us, all of us, uh, you know, senior administrators at the university to to kind of mirror the diversity around us, you know, uh, and on a state that you can say, hey, things seem to be kind of skewing one side, we need to bring those um groups and communities around us. And that's why I also like a host, a youth communities in plural. I don't, I think we need to bring that into our everyday language. So you, we can be aware that it's not just one group, but several groups that we're trying to serve. So I'm, I'm very proud that to be in a university or being a museum university with a leadership that is pushing us to, to do that. You know, it's also interesting, and you bring you bring in this idea of diversity within the uh, Latin Hispanic community. There's this incredible diversity within the, what we call the Asian community, incredible diversity, right? So we're, no one is just one thing. This idea of people bouncing into each other, challenging each other, challenging assumptions, looking at um, an anthropological exhibit and saying, wait a second. Look at it from a different perspective. Maybe there's knowledge in here that you have never discovered simply because you're not looking at it from my perspective, right? Absolutely. Um, and here we have um, what you could call um, Hispanic communities where their second language is Spanish. So for Spanish would be lingua franca for people you know, coming from different countries in Central or South America. So, uh, so it, it's like a third layer, like English, Spanish, and their own, you know, uh, uh, language. Uh, so it's it's those things that you need to 
observe, acknowledge, and then uh, act on purpose because otherwise you will be creating even more, um, I don't know, differences or creating more barriers uh, for accessing what is knowledge that belongs to everyone. To and, and I really mean it to everyone. And Amy, we're we're talking. We've talked mostly about boards and staffs and internal scientists and so on and so forth. But you also have this diverse audience coming in, and you're trying to connect them where they live, where they feel, where their emotions uh, lie, where their interests lie. How do you? I mean, connecting to audience is so complicated because everybody's an individual, and then there then there are clusters of interests and clusters of ages. How do you change? your staff, your approach to deal with the rising consciousness that we're having that we could do better? Yeah. Well, I think our superpower as a university museum is our students. Uh, we have a pretty diverse set of student employees. We've, we've had as many as 80 as a time at a time. It's a longstanding student docent program since the 50s. Um, and we train these students. We pay them. It's a job for them. And they look like our audience. And that's part of our goal is to make sure that when our audience comes in the door, they are, there's a good chance that they'll see somebody who looks like them, who's enthusiastic, who's really excited to share their knowledge with them. Well, this has been just terrific. Um, I'm actually going to give uh, one of our attendees the last word uh, because this is going to be another show. Thomas Broadhead asks, um, I know many museums worldwide are in the process of rep repatriating indigenous objects. Look at what's happening with the Benin bronzes, for example, and what has happened um, and, and still is work to be done with native uh, art, uh, art and artifacts uh, here in this country. Um, and he, he, he says, uh, Thomas says, how can the Native uh, American Graves uh, Protection and Repatriation Act be used by museums to better share with visitors the importance of cultural heritage uh, Thomas, we're going to make a, a, a show on this. Uh, it's just a great question, um, and, and we're going to deal with it. Uh, but these are the kinds of issues that you're all dealing with, right, as, as you're trying to uh, keep faith with knowledge, but also respect uh, the different perspectives that, that we're just becoming educated in uh, through people uh, like Thomas. So thank you all. It's just been great. Claudio Gomez, Executive Director of the McClung Museum of Natural History and Culture at the University of Tennessee. Amy Harris, Director of the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History and Halsey Spruance, Executive Director of the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science. We are in your debt. Please thank your staffs, your boards, your supporters, and your communities for, for helping us to understand your world just a little bit better. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. It was really fun.